Hey, hey, fellow comic book fans and readers. Um, it is I, Sleepy Reader, a.k.a. Damien. Um, yet another comic book countdown. This time I got 12 new comics this week. And um, they were pretty much all really good reads. Uh, no, no stinkers whatsoever. So it was a great week of comic book reading. I'm still going to rank them super subjectively from number 12 down to number 1. And what I did this time, which is going to mean a lot of editing, and I'll probably regret it, is I recorded little snippets of my reactions to each comic after, uh, shortly after I read it. And now I'm going to put them all together. At the time, I didn't know what their ranking would be, so you'll just have to see. I've, I've put some titles in to tell you which what the ranks of the comic are, you know, what number it is. And uh, anyway, uh, I probably won't do this sort of thing too often, but I just thought it would be a change of pace a little bit in a way, switch things up. So I'll start with number 12. Edgar Allan Poe's Snifter of Blood, issue number two, really the third volume of these Edgar Allan Poe anthologies from Ahoy Comics. It was just kind of fun. Two stories, one continuing the... Um, the saga of these characters based on serial characters like uh, Count Chocula uh, fighting a war against General Post. Is that it? The name General Mills, General Post? I'm not sure. And then a retelling of Edgar Allan Poe's, Edgar Allan Poe trying to tell his story of the cast, cask of Al Almatalo. Could never pronounce that. Uh, to a group of literary figures like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, and they all kind of ruin his storytelling and try to change his story for him. And that, that was kind of amusing. So kind of amusing, kind of fun, but for some reason, I hadn't noticed this before, if issue one was like that, they're charging um, $5 now for this, and it's only 22 pages of actual comics. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, I really like the cover. I think that was my favorite thing. I feel like I somewhere have this comic book that it's spoofing, like a a black and white uh, Marvel comic maybe, or some other black and white uh, magazine from the 70s. And I like how they do the um, picture. Looks even cooler, actually, uh, full size, so to speak, on the back cover. So, yeah, if this was regular price, I'd be a bit happier about it. Grendel, Kentucky, number three of four from AWA. This is a really cool concept, really great art by um, um, Tommy Lee Edwards and his colorist, who is named Giovanna, Giovanna Nero. Um, and it, but it doesn't live up to my excite what I was hoping for, I guess between the great art and the concept of kind of a, a Grendel in backwoods Kentucky in 1971, a Grendel monster and a, a Beowulf character who's a woman, a leader of a woman's bike gang. Uh, I think that, it, you know, we get a whole bunch of info dumped, in this issue we get a whole bunch of info dumped on us in one section, and then a big long fight scene with not quite enough visual info to really um, parse the whole fight scene because it's all about uh, the Beowulf character, I can't remember her name's, plan for getting Grendel. Um, and even when they kind of finish off Grendel, it's kind of unclear. Like, that's supposed to be a picture of Grendel going back down into the mine, all wounded, and they say he's going to bleed out. And then if you know the the myth of Beowulf, the, the tale of Beowulf, the saga of Beowulf, I guess it is, you know who comes after Grendel. Barbalian barbarian alien maybe uh but the the issue number one of a mini series from the uh world of black hammer jeff lemire and a co-writer on here and uh, gabriel hernandez walters walta's art who i know best from from the vision series by uh with writer tom king i really like the art in here the coloring could have been better i felt in terms of bringing the the art to its fullest degree because it it kind of made the art look hazy and i think that's on purpose but i'm not sure whether i like that aesthetic choice 
but there's still a lot to love in the in the art and the story is kind of sad and grim and involves AIDS um, there is something slightly odd about the idea of a a gay shape-changing alien who uh, I guess gets involved with gay humans um, not sure whether that really makes sense to me but probably shouldn't think about it too closely I just think about it more closely as we get this sort of serious grim uh, morality play I guess about the era of AIDS and AIDS denial so um, anyway I'm enjoying it uh, and it's it's interesting without knowing what this vault comic was I picked it up off the shelf a uh, dark interlude. I think this may be my favorite cover of my comics this week, so it's probably because of the cover that I picked up. But I think I flipped through it and saw the art looked okay, and maybe I saw someone online mentioning it. I'm not sure, but I really enjoyed it quite a bit. It's kind of a wacky. I don't even know what to call it, but told from the point of view of a gone insane plagiarist author. Um, called Henry Henry and I guess it's it's a sequel to another comic so called Fearscape I love the name Dark Interlude but I don't think I would have picked up a comic called Fearscape at least not without some reason to but now I may want to go back and look at this Fearscape comic it's kind of a a dark parody of some sort I mean there's some dark humor going on here there's this world of kind of fears the fearscape I guess um, and every generation a new great writer is sent there to fight off the monsters and um, there's a character who's been locked up there for a long time who I guess is Shakespeare I, I don't fully understand all of the mechanics of everything in this fantasy world and there's definitely uh, pages here that are really delicious coloring um, you know, not all of the pages have that delicious coloring or, you know, hit that mark, but some of them do. So um, the colorist, the artist is Andre Muti, which is a name I feel like I've heard before. The colorist is named Vladimir Popov. The artist, the writer is Ryan O'Sullivan. And it starts with this uh, sort of letter, open letter, I guess, to readers at the beginning from the fictional author of the, of the, of the story. Um, oh, there's one that shows you some really wild, fun coloring. So yeah, it's a bit in the vein, I suppose, of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman or something, not exactly like it, and the tone is different. But that's the closest I could make an analogy to, and it is, doesn't seem, you know, from one issue to necessarily be on that level, but it's hard to tell. We live issue two from Aftershock from the Miranda brothers, Inaki Miranda, the the awesome artist and his brother um, Roy Miranda helping out with the uh, with the story I believe uh, this was a strong issue it definitely went to places I was not expecting and um, it kind of answers the question in an unexpected way of what kind of story this is going to be at least for the first arc or two um, whether we're going to go out into space very quickly or stay on earth I think it's going to be on earth going to be a wild adventure on this much changed world I'm looking for pages that don't give too much away um, but the whole who the main characters are and uh, what our focus of the story is has been narrowed down quite a bit and um, yeah I'm, I'm glad I jumped on onto this despite the overpriced first issue uh, this is shaping up to be to look like a really uh, fun and somewhat intense series Usagi Ojimbo wraps up a four-part storyline um, where he returns to his old village. I have to say I did not connect as much emotionally with this particular storyline than all the other Us Usagi storylines I read. It was still a good story. A lot of fighting, a lot of violence in this issue. No blood, of course, but a lot of people dying nonetheless. Um, and, uh, yeah, it kind of wraps up. I'm still sort of excited for what, what's coming next. Um, there's lots of bits and details that I like here, but, but it wasn't the best Yusagi ever. There's a little note about Tom Luth, the colorist, retiring. 
He's been working for 30 years with Stan Sakai and for 30 years, I presume, with um, the other folks shown here, including Sergio Aragonez. It does mention that his coloring will, his last bits of coloring will appear in Sergio Aragonez's Gods Against Gru four-issue miniseries. So that must be coming up from Dark Horse. And they also mention that there's one that he already worked on called Gru Meets Tarzan, which we haven't seen yet. So the most exciting thing for me was the announcement of two upcoming Gru stories. Okay, I read Long, not Long Live the King. I read um, Once in Future. It does say Long Live the King on the back of the cover, that's why. Um, this was a really fun issue. It was kind of uh, uh, moving into the next story beat, the next story arc. Um, each one is really just a chapter, so each issue is like a piece of a chapter. But um, as always, really great art and color. And um, for, for a kind, the kind of story that could have been just filler, trying to get from one part of the uh, action to the next, this actually was a really good issue. And I really enjoyed, enjoyed it, and it made me really look forward to the coming chapter of um, what we're gonna see. There's a lot of talk about being part of the story and the magic of that or the uh, tragedy of that, the horror of that, the horror of becoming part of one of these stories, um, meaning the stories of mythology like uh, King Arthur and Beowulf and such. And, um, and that was really cool. I just constantly have the sense that Kieran Gillen is a little smarter than me and he doesn't realize that I, the reader, I'm not quite as smart as he is, and I'd like a few more dots connected here and there to what everything means rather than just hints, you know, in terms of the story and what these stories are. I don't know the, the stories as well as he does. Engine Word keeps growing on me. Engine Word from Vault. Um, the fun double covers, some, the, uh, the creativity of the panel work is increasing. And of course, I'm a big science fiction fan, and as the science fiction scenario develops here, and it's been <coughs> kind of gradual, but I've appreciated that, um, I just enjoy it more and more. That Now, I'm still kind of sad they didn't set things up better right at the beginning. Um, I'm still you know, wishing we had a better view of what the... Um, the relationship to the regular people in the village and these celestials, that one's Scorpio, they're all uh, horoscope based or astrology based. Um, but we've got a really interesting rev a revelation about aliens who used to live on the planet before the humans arrived and there's still just a few survivors. And um, yeah, the complications that are, that are arising are making this a more and more interesting read as it goes along. So I'm definitely in for the ride. I hear it's supposed to be 12 issues for the 12 uh, Celestials because there's one on each cover. So hopefully it makes the full 12 issues and it, it will be a good science fiction ride. Juggernaut number three. I believe this is a miniseries. Um, it's finally really uh, starting to click with me. I, I was not too excited. I didn't hate it, but I wasn't too excited about the um, plot or the storyline. In the first two issues but um it's kicked into high gear here and it's um it's more fun somehow for me the art of course the angle the colors were great all along love ron garney and matt Millaw does a great job on the colors um but uh yeah maybe fabian nicienza was building up elements that eventually start clicking into a good story so it might make a very good trade read i'm guessing i still wish uh, Juggernaut were purely a villain, but uh, but that's fine. It's a good story. I'm wondering. <clears throat> I like that damage controls in here. We've got legal fights. We've got backstory of about the bands of Citriox or whatever that a, a little bit of backstory bands of Citriox that uh, Juggernaut uses to gain his power. Got this uh, crazy villain Quicksand and a building up of some kind of. Uh, secret conspiracy that brings in a great villain of the past that I, one that i really love um so i'm looking forward to seeing how uh, ron garney will draw that villain next issue uh 
what the, the thing I've been wondering is there's this character D cell who I wasn't who wasn't really clicking with me at first and that's probably why she started to feel like a more uh, useful character to me in this issue is kind of a foil and a good sort of storytelling um, not gimmick but storytelling tool um, and foil for the character of Juggernaut so um, her name is D cell I think and she can decelerate things I guess I'm not totally clear on all her powers but she seems like kind of a cool character and there's kind of an ongoing question of whether she's a mutant or not she keeps claiming she is not a mutant but anyhow um, was her first appearance in Juggernaut number one uh, should all the collectors be running out to get Juggernaut number one I don't know enough about the the Marvel continuity to know if she's appeared elsewhere in the Marvel Universe I'm still enjoying Big Girls a lot. We're only on issue four, and we really got a lot about the world and the characters. So um, I think that's very impressive. I don't know if Jason Howard, the artist and writer and colorist, colorist on this, uh, has done writing before, but he's doing it. I think he's doing an excellent job with a science fiction story, which is always tricky because of the world building has to be mixed in organically with everything else in the story. Uh, you know, it's it's not perfect in some ways, but in other ways it is. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out the coloring here. Um, he never does, I mean, he's the line artist, but I've seen even people, art, line artists cover up their own art with coloring too much. He never gets in the way of the line art, but he still does interesting things with color, like in this background. And back here, he he suggests more foliage in the background, but there's no sense of a filter or some kind of color that's sort of overwhelming the line art. Uh, it, the color always works with the line art. And I really appreciate that. Um, and of course, it's it's just kind of a wacky, wild story. It's kind of an emotional roller coaster, and at this point, I'm not sure whose side to be on. I don't fully understand this character. I mean, I. I think she went from a good person to a bad person, but maybe she's still partially a good person. I don't know. And she is the former wife of the leader of the other side, so to speak. The, um, the, the big girl side versus the big boy side, you might say. Uh, I still, I'm looking forward to finding out more about the big boys and what's really going on with them. And as I said, I'm really appreciating the fact that there's so many shades of gray here, along with just loving the art. Look at that sort of subtle use of color rather than, and, and then a st still a strong use of ink and black, black ink and drawing. Because I love drawing. I, that's one of the great things about comics. It's one of the greatest places to see great drawing. So why, would, why do people overwhelm it with color sometimes? Oh, I'm back on that hob hobby horse again. Ice Cream Man is back with issue 21, and I'm quite bummed that my shop didn't have the A cover, the main cover. It only had this variant cover. I mean, yes, this is a really cool and creepy image, but it doesn't really relate to the comic, and I would love to have the cover that goes with the story in this issue. I found this this a fascinating read. I As I flipped the pages and started going, I was like, wait, is this some kind of riff on Watchmen, a lot of nine panel grids. And then I noticed the coloring was kind of a distinctive form of coloring that you don't normally see in Ice Cream Man. And maybe it is riffing off of the the cool coloring that Watchmen had, the original Watchmen by um, uh, Alan Moore and Gibbons and the colorist John Higgins. Um, but it also, I decided, is probably riffing off of the later Avatar books that that uh, Moore did with a lot of Cthulhu references and such. So, um, yeah, this was a very, very enjoyable read, as is always expected with uh, Ice Cream Man, and a dense read. It took a nice long time, a very pleasurable longer read for a modern comic uh, to get through, and there's a lot to chew on here. I'm definitely going to have to reread it sometime soon. Uh, one of the themes running through it is um, a marriage that becomes kind of a dead marriage, along with 
a mystery story and the Cthulhu stuff and some kind of connection to an empire of ice cream companies. <laughs> so, um, yeah, definitely. I think this is a harder one. I mean, it, uh, maybe an even more mysterious. There's some been some very mysterious what is going on kind of issues of Ice Cream Man. And this is one of those, I think. In the end, by the end of the book, I'm like, what really happened? What's really going on? And part of me was wishing that this would somehow tie in to a larger narrative uh, that we'll come back to some themes in here. But at this point, after 21 issues, there have been other issues where I've thought, will it come back? Will we tie back into it? And it, it seems dicey whether we ever will. But anyway, still a great issue. And kind of sad it's over and I'm done reading it. But I will get to reread it, so that will be cool. Wow, just another great issue of Al Ewing and Joe Bennett's Hulk with this great cover by Alex Ross. I have to point out the um, most old time fans will recognize that's a very Sal Buscema style of drawing the Hulk's face, which, uh, which um, Alex Ross is kind of giving a tribute to here, I think. Anyway, that was a really cool cover. We get all kinds of continuations of the themes of wild body changes and ex body swaps and personalities moving around and personalities pulled out of your head and torn down to hell and all of that is just <laughs> oh, i don't i don't want to give away too much so i'm not showing the best pages but uh a really good joe fix it issue you might say um and some fun stuff with uh wait they're not called alpha flight what are they called the version of alpha flight that's up in space some good stuff there. Um, and at the end, the appearance of a old foe of the Hulks that I was not expecting. Um, a good guy who's an old foe of the Hulks. Um, a very good guy. So anyway, uh, yeah, this is continuing to just sort of amaze as one of uh, the very best current comic books. And definitely, well, I don't read a ton of Marvel but from my perception, you know, definitely head and shoulders above anything else you can get from Marvel. But I could be wrong on that because I don't read Daredevil, for instance. So there you go. It was a great week of comics. Um, one of those weeks that makes me really glad that I stick with the modern comics and spend a lot of money on them. And I think for me, sorry to always harp on the coloring, but it was notable that almost all these comics had coloring that worked well with the art <laughs> and it's funny that i even have to talk about that but that's something that i keep noticing there was really only one comic the barbalian that where the color you know made me go oh, i wish they'd colored this a different way um and some of the coloring was absolutely spectacular and just made the issues pop and made them even more exciting to read so uh deep appreciation to all the comic book creators out there putting out all the hard work Sometimes it really pays off well. I will hope I hope you all have a great comic are having a great comic book week and I will um, be back soon.